Sure. Um, my name is Matthew Spoke. I'm the CEO and co-founder of, of Nuco. Uh, we're a Toronto-based um, uh, tech company, uh, Java implementation, part of the EEA standard. Uh, so I also sit on the board with Sandra, um, and we're really excited to be part of this, uh, this standard setting as it moves forward. That's great. And uh, my name is York Rhodes, and I, I'm actually on my second tour at Microsoft, and now 100% of my time is focused on blockchain. Um, we are a founding member of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Um, we are very supportive of uh, driving enterprise requirements into blockchain ledgers uh, and then also extending those capabilities such that uh, enterprises can more rapidly adopt uh, blockchain value propositions. Hi, I'm Sandeep Kumar. I'm Managing Director at Cinecron. We run Phil Labs and we are so excited to be the, one of the newest members of the Alliance. We work extensively in Ethereum and build applications on blockchain for banks. Hi everyone, my name is Maxim, and I'm a software engineer at Chronicle. So with Chronicle, we are focusing on uh, intersection of IoT and blockchain. So yeah. basically this is it. Great. Uh, this panel, we're really gonna focus on giving you a working group update. One of the critical things that we really want to emphasize about EEA is that this is not about a top-down uh, structure. Yes, there is a board, but the board is there really to do uh, a lot of the administrative and sort of boring stuff to get things moving along in, in such a large organization. The working groups themselves are the real heart and engine of um, advancements and making sure that we are as collaborative and, um, you know, we are able to do, meet our goals. Um, so what I want Matt to do, if he would take the time, is to give us a bit of background on what is going on with the membership and a little bit of marketing. Great, yeah. Um, so you, you must have seen the, the Coindesk announcement this morning, and obviously Julio mentioned it earlier. Um, so we've, we've just gone through onboarding 86 new members into the Alliance. It's been a very uh, time-consuming process to go through the number of applications. I think uh, as it stands today, we still have uh, a few hundred members, kind of uh, potential members waiting on the waiting list that have to be processed. So obviously at the membership level, um, it's a matter of us screening these companies. Um, very basically, we've structured the alliance around very simple membership criteria. Um, those being that you are uh, interested in Ethereum and its use in the enterprise domain. Is my microphone going on and off? Can, yeah, okay. Um, is this better? I'm getting signals from the front row. Okay. Um, if it goes off, I'll grab the mic. Um, so, I think it went off again. Okay, why don't I take the microphone? Um, all right, that's better. So maybe I'll, I'll step back for a sec. Um, so we, we just onboarded 86 new members. We're very excited about that. It was an extremely time consuming process to get the process going. You'll, you'll have noticed today that the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance uh, new website is live where we can start processing member applications significantly more efficiently. Our membership committee uh, is chaired by uh, Jeremy Miller uh, of Consensus. Uh, the process that the membership committee has been going through is essentially applying applicants to a very simple list of criteria, uh, meaning that you're interested in the use of Ethereum-based technologies in enterprise. So very, very loose. Um, and short of that, it's pretty much an open invitation for anybody to join, whether you're an individual or a large enterprise. Uh, there is a membership-free structure that is published on our website. Um, we'd be happy to kind of field any questions that you have. Anybody that's kind of sitting up here that's a member uh, can obviously answer any questions. So that's been the process that we've been going through on the membership side. And now the technology working group, as you can imagine, is critical to everything we're going to be doing. And so York is going to spend a few minutes talking about the latest update on the technology working group. So I think it's also uh, important to note how we launched. Um, we actually launched with a reference implementation from Quorum, um, which was contributed by JP Morgan. That was a very pragmatic decision that said, hey, we actually have something that looks good. So we should actually bring that uh, to bear uh, back when we launched in the end of February. Um, the new version of that, uh, as Julio mentioned earlier, is actually launching this week. Uh, and that will allow uh, multi-node deployment across enterprises. Um, so that you can actually effectively set up a quorum test net very easily through a, essentially what we call a one-click uh, deployment, but it's a one-click plus some parameters. Um, and it allows you to do all the things that you'd expect to do successfully to get an enterprise implementation with multiple business partners up and running, such as setting up VPNs and things like that um, in, in a very seamless way. 
um, this reduces your time to market, therefore reduces your time to value. Um, so you can start to focus on how do we add value in terms of applications on top of this implementation. That general thesis is really the whole thesis behind enterprise Ethereum. How do we actually reduce time to value in a, in a way that actually creates what I would call standardized deployment frameworks or reference architectures such that everyone is not trying to achieve the same sort of mid and end goal by uh, stripping out technologies that otherwise would have existed, say, in a public Ethereum implementation. Um, this work, when we start to think about enterprise, um, you obviously you think about deployment models, as I just mentioned, um, which is one of the reasons why we're launching this next rev of the quorum template on Azure. Um, but you also think about things like uh, instrumentation and how do you actually uh, look at the heartbeat and the life of a network and all of the objects in that network such that you can have reliability and know that that network is performing as it should be performing in order to run your business processes on that. So we're doing a lot of work at the instrumentation layer from a specifications perspective to say, you know, you need to be able to do things like heartbeats and, and uh, node distance and all kinds of, you know, very sort of a list of about 20 different technical things that allow you to have the same type of enterprise managerial oversight that you would on any other enterprise application. So this is a pretty important aspect um, of any enterprise application and therefore we're driving that into the reference architecture and specifications in the working group. And then we obviously look at how do we advance um, the modularity uh, of the solution such that you can swap out um, particular components like a consensus algorithm for example. Um, so that's one of the primary focuses in, in the working group initially is having swappable consensus. Um, this helps you to drive towards very modular components and we just picked consensus because it's a fairly well-known uh, example of something that's been swapped out before. Um, and it allows you then to create defined uh, APIs essentially between layers of the, of the stack, which gets you modularity that you want, which then also starts to get you the types of scale that you want to uh, look at in terms of, you know, in terms of a, an enterprise implementation. Um, scalability and performance obviously varies across use cases, um, but measuring and understanding what is a benchmark is really important in any enterprise context so that you can understand if I stand up these types of VMs, uh, this is the type of performance that I should expect. If I'm not seeing that performance based on the instrumentation, then there's something wrong because I'm not hitting the benchmark, so I know I need to go back and look at you know, other aspects of, of my network. So it's really focused on how do you sort of get at uh, an understanding of operating this environment um, and not have to be you know, sort of pinging things and looking at things at the command line level. Well, I, maybe I'll, I'll just add, is this on? Both of my microphones aren't working. <laughs> um, they don't, nobody wants to hear me talk. Uh, maybe I'll just add, you know, the overlap between the, the types of members that we're attracting into the EEA and the work that's happening at the technical working group, I think really highlights one of the reasons that this group came together. And it was that there was, especially in the Ethereum space, there was a lot of people competing around standards. Um, and there was, you know, different implementation and different forks and different people doing different things and building their own consensus algorithms. And what I think we realized as a group is that there was a lot of reinventing the wheel going on among different vendors um, and requirements of the actual enterprises that needed this technology was almost secondary to the fact that everybody wanted their standard to be the standard. Um, so what we're enabling here is if you look at that list of members, not only among the large enterprises involved in the EA, but also among the tech vendors involved in the EA, there are competitors um, in this group. And, and the reason that we think that this is so powerful is it allows us to kind of agree on a certain set of parameters and, and architectural decisions and then compete on implementation rather than compete on standards. Um, so everything that, that York was just highlighting uh, is kind of driving towards that model so that we can reduce vendor lock-in for, for customers so that there's more portability among applications built with one vendor that could potentially be moved over to another vendor if an infrastructure change has to happen. Um, so that's kind of the driving motivation behind this technical working group. Um, even from the perspective of one of these tech vendors myself. I would just add one, one point to that is that um, largely the specifications have been driven by enterprise. So there's obviously great awareness within, within the uh, smaller vendor or startup space about enterprise requirements, but the actual requirements have been driven by the large enterprises that are uh, part of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Yeah, and if you look at some of the members, especially the founding members, like banks like JP Morgan, 
Santander, CME, some of the requirements they are dealing with are the most complex. And I think every enterprise will face those challenges about data privacy, interoperability, scalability, aspects of it. If I publish a transaction and later on regulators want to see it, how do you do it? So a lot of learnings from this. Uh, I'm so happy to see that announcement of 100 plus members now. Uh, the path will get a little bit easier for the rest of the community on this. Thanks, everyone. We're going to switch gears a little bit and have Maxim talk about Chronicled. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Chronicled, you should definitely uh, check them out. <laughs> they are really doing some very interesting things in crossover with uh, IoT, smart contracts, and blockchain. And so, Maxim, can you talk a little bit about your yeah. experience as a member and then a bit about the company and how you see IoT and uh, Enterprise <coughs> Ethereum Alliance working together? Okay. Sure. So, yeah, as I mentioned before, we are in an in intersection of IoT and blockchain. We are kind of bridging the gap between physical world and the digital world. Basically, now you can program uh, physical things in smart contracts. So uh, what we do is we build in uh, custom hardware that we can add in any physical object. And uh, each hardware piece has its own identity. Basically, it's like a hardware security module. And uh, what we can do with this is basically solve anti uh, counterfeit problem. Uh, we can do machine-to-machine -machine interactions. For example, we did a demo project uh, where a drone uh, can gain access to some uh, property uh, by means of uh, our hardware module plus uh, it, uh, smart contract in the blockchain. So uh, also, uh, these solutions are uh, very applicable and demandable in uh, uh, supply chain space. Uh, so, uh, as of now, we developed uh, Open Registry, uh, which we build with uh, our partners. We have also a lot of uh, uh, partners uh, from startups to big corporations. And we, as of now, we have implementations. Uh, so, basically, it's like a protocol which allows uh, everyone who works with um, IoT speaks the same language. And uh, we deployed, as of now, we deployed to Ethereum, uh, Quorum, and also Hyperledger, just to have a um, kind of common set of rules everywhere. And it's up to client to decide uh, which blockchains they're going to use. Um, so um, as of now, we focus in, so we did different projects. We tried ourselves in different fields. As of now, we are focusing on supply chain and uh, deploying uh, our products. Uh, one is CryptoSeal, maybe you heard about, it, and another one is Templogger. It looks like this. So this is a small uh, piece that you can stick to any uh, physical object and uh, track its uh, sensor parameters. So as uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance member, we were really happy to use Quorum. And uh, we are running it uh, almost for two months now, or even more. And uh, we, we have no issues. So. Um, also, as of now, we're making Quorum our default uh, deployment platform. Uh, also, in, in part, for, for first part is because it's easier to deal with, uh, to deploy, to de develop. And another part is uh, da data intense uh, solutions are uh, really expensive to deploy in Ethereum, especially after this uh, price jump, uh, like a uh, huge. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, but we still leave identity project on Ethereum, um, but uh, all the like uploading data from sensors is gonna be on Quorum, most likely. Uh, what would we like to see in uh, in developments of uh, Quorum or the client is uh, first of all is uh, privacy. Uh, I would like to see privacy moving from the off-chain consensus kind of to the on-chain, uh, using probably using some zero knowledge. Uh, Proof, sorry. Boy, you really segue right into what I was going to ask Sandeep about, which is yeah. the private into the public, but uh, please finish. Yeah, so we would like to see uh, zero knowledge proof inside of forum, and um, probably I see the person out there that can help you out, it's Aaron. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, we, I think it's, this is the way to go, and uh, probably integrating uh, with uh, ZK Snarks library uh, is the way to go. Also, some improvements on uh, data. So even if you run Quorum em empty without any transactions, it will produce a lot of uh, like gigabytes of data. So probably some optimizations in this area would be nice to have. And uh, having own ether scan 
is, is also a good idea because uh, for people, uh, you already have like a dashboard, uh, but also having um, some read-only read um, system just to discover uh, blocks, transactions to show to clients is, uh, I think, very yeah. nice feature to have. <coughs> Everybody has a very long wish list. I think members will contribute <laughs> to this. Yeah. Well, Sanjeev, if you could pick up the conversation with uh, talking about a little bit about public versus public. private and yep. your views around, yep. uh, you know, a potential migration or, you know, evolution to the public side, how do you see that yep. evolving? And then also your views as the latest and newest EPA yeah. member. Certainly, yeah. So, uh, we started working on blockchain applications for banks, insurance companies about a year ago, and we came out with... Uh, very exciting versions, but they turned out to be very simple applications. You know, the requirements of the bank is quite complex uh, when you deal with data privacy and how the transaction should, should be viewed by different parties. So we did work on trade finance, mortgage processing, uh, KYC, and many, many such applications. And just as part of the uh, uh, new membership, we are also making uh, uh, the Coda version of trade finance live on Microsoft Azure platform this week. So everybody can download and see how it works, uh, how the privacy works between different parties. We are so fortunate to have uh, uh, the Quorum application working so out in, in the area of data privacy so well. So uh, what we've seen with the banks and insurance companies is there are many, many use cases which will require a lot of privacy of the transaction. But at the same time, some part of the transaction has to go into the public domain. So think stock trading, for example. That could be a very private transaction or mortgage processing could be very private, but a part of that, let's say, what was the average rate paid by homeowners in the last month has to go in the public domain as well. There's so many pieces of this. So it's none of the use cases we find are purely private or purely public. So with the base Ethereum, uh, we were finding this very hard to implement a public come private or private come public type of use case. And then when we see the Quorum releases, when we see the Quorum roadmap, that makes our job so much easier. Otherwise, we were writing a lot of smart contracts to achieve and ending up with huge amounts of code to make this happen. Now, using many, many quorum constructs, uh, we can uh, achieve this very, very beautifully in mortgage processing. KYC is a big example. A lot of your customers will, uh, will have certain public identity. A lot of this data will be private. So uh, quorum, having a platform like quorum can combine these two things and deliver uh, your application onto this. That's actually an important point about the roadmap, and it is to align with public Ethereum and stay close enough to public Ethereum such that you can actually have a hybrid, very easily have a hybrid environment where you can make decisions about which part of your data is actually exposed publicly and which is kept in a private environment. If you think about doing this today in a, in a blockchain context, it, it's actually quite complex. Um, so if we can align the roadmaps together, which is really the goal of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, is to stay closely aligned to public Ethereum, then we actually get at least to a place where the playing field is somewhat level. And then on top of that, as we have new developments and uh, discoveries and, and implementations, we can actually contribute those back into public Ethereum so that public Ethereum can advance as well in terms of enterprise requirements. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, good night change tact a little bit and go back to sort of the membership working group. Uh, we've got over 100 members now. EEA uh, announced at the end of February. Do we run into the danger of being so inclusive that we get so big that it becomes untenable? Matt, do you have any thoughts around that? How do we prevent ourselves from becoming just, you know, a very large group that does nothing? I, th I think one of the... You know, one of the guiding principles behind how we, <laughs> I don't know if we should applaud that or not. Uh, <laughs> one of the guiding principles behind how we set this up was, as, as Julio said earlier, very member driven. So um, as much as the EEA is this umbrella structure, um, the, the intention is, you know, th there's gonna be differences of philosophies, there's gonna be differences of priorities, differences of industries, competitors, non-competitors, et cetera. And what's really exciting to me about the, the structure that we've put in place, the governance model that we've built, is that pretty much anybody with any idea can create a working group around that idea, right? And, and whether that's, you know, quorum as a, as a privacy concept, or even if an alternative privacy concept comes up and wants to get developed and thought out and tested, you know, there's nothing restricting that. So there's, there's, no, there's no, you know, uh, decision-making process that says, 
here's the only priorities we're going to work on. We're not going to accept anything else. So if, if somebody joins the group and says, I'd really like to start working at a particular implementation of this identity management system, then we'll help them coordinate a working group around that. Our hope is that that drives the responsibility into the hands of the members rather than the members waiting for the EEA to do stuff for them. This joining, and you know, this should probably be bold letters on our website as you apply to join, we will not be driving value for you. You have to be driving value as part of this organization. So if, if members join simply to be observers, then you kind of get what you paid for. You're not going to get much as an observer. You'll get something as an active participant leading and participating in the technical working group in very specific use case uh, working groups, whatever the case might be. Uh, so I don't think we get to that point because at the very least, if we have this large group of members, you'll probably see them organized uh, around industry topics, around technical topics that they find particularly interesting and align with their priorities. Yeah, I think, I think we're seeing that from some of the projects that are going on, whether they're you know, like a supply chain IoT working group that's very focused on how do we actually start to create de facto standards around data formats um, when you start to think about tracking di uh, physical assets. Um, or you know specific implementations of of, of the client, um, so that people are charging ahead, uh, and then you know making sure that 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 gets fed back into sort of the core uh, standards and, and architectures that get defined. Yeah, and if you take any use cases, let's say trade finance, it may sound like a financial services use case, but at the same time, it needs all the corporates to be part of it, insurance companies to be part of it, the shipping data providers to be part of it. So when I see the variety of membership here, from manufacturers to big uh, corporations, and of course the banks are here, insurance companies, I think that is the best part. None of the use cases can be done in a very contained way anymore. They are threatening to be, become live, let's say by end of the year, unless you put real data, real participants into it, uh, this won't be a success. So uh, that way this group has the right mix of participants. You know. And uh, thanks to the uh, open sourcing of the technical work that is being done by members, you get a very good base to uh, build up your business flows on it. I think maybe the other thing worth highlighting, because we, we brought this up to launch, um, is also the, the way that the governance is being incentivized internally is that you know, nobody sitting on the board today or leading working groups or anything like that is, 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 is beholden to that position. Everybody can be rotated out. Everybody, the, the intention that we had, the principle that started the EEA was around um, contributions determining your influence in the group, meaning you know, there is no paid seat onto the board of directors, there is no paid seat to lead a working group. If you work, then your influence will be kind of noted in the group, and then you essentially become more. So you know, I think it, everything is built around incentivizing members to actively participate rather than incentivizing members to just observe others. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's quite unique for the EEA. Andrew, I have a feeling Matt's going to want you to add a tagline that says, we want builders, doers, innovators, not just talkers. <laughs> OK. Yeah. So when we think about where EEA is right now, it's still at its infancy. There's a lot of um, aspirations. And I think a year from now, we'll determine when we come back here and we evaluate what we've done, uh, we'll really know, you know whether we have success or not. But in the meantime, I'd like to get some views on what does success mean to you with respect to the EEA? What would you like to see in a year's time? What have we done? Uh, for us, success, it means uh, success for our customers, for sure, for uh, solving solutions uh, using Quorum, for example. Will you bring your drone? We do have a demo <laughs> next year? Yeah, but uh, everyone will need to sign agreement <laughs> because I'm not responsible for flying it inside. Right, in case you get a head injury, he wants you to sign off. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, for me, the success means uh, you have a very good technical base, very good membership. Uh, let's say in nine months, 12 months, you said one year time. If a real business flow can go into production, without wor people worrying about whether it runs on blockchain or what technology stack and so on without mentioning this. And it doesn't matter how small is the business flow, but it should be real business getting conducted, maybe buying a house and the titles running on the blockchain and things like this. Uh, that will be the real success. You know, a very small flow going live. I think this large group uh, and with this kind of depth, it is very much possible to achieve in, in a year's time. I think from, from my perspective, if, if we continue to advance the work that we're doing on Quorum, that's sort of one, one track. 
Um, and as I said, we're launching some new work this week, so um, we're certainly doing that at a, at a rapid pace. Um, the, I think if we look back at, at say, I would, I would say a year might be too long. Actually, um, maybe I'm aggressive, but um, around uh, end, of, end of December, would be, I'd like to have sort of as a marker to say that, you know, we've got uh, the major, major continued advancements, not just in terms of the code base of something like Quorum, but also the use cases have been actually deployed in, you know, quasi-production or production type of environments. I think we're on track to do that. Um, I think we also have uh, some pretty good alignment from vendors as well to have um, uh, reference compliant implementations of their products uh, released. And I think that, you know, certainly in this time frame, we expect to see that. I, well, I mean, we've referenced the reference itself a few times, the specifications. So I think a big objective that we have as a group is that by the end of the year, uh, we've published what that reference is. We, we've we've kind of said what are our initial technical priorities and how should this work, um, and then uh, to York's point, you know, if we could demonstrate quite simply that two vendors matching that same standard are able to kind of interoperate on a, on a single network, I think that would be a, an enormous success. Um, but getting that standard out is no small feat in and of itself. The technical working group has obviously got a whole bunch of different perspectives and priorities within it. So getting that standard in place is going to be an uh, a big milestone for us at the end of the year. I, I completely agree. I think getting the standards out into the public domain, and then success will really be how many enterprises, how many fintech firms, how many how many in the community actually adopt it as the standard. And, and to, to me, that would be success. So let's see. We've got a lot of work to do. Yep. All right, well look, we only have a couple minutes. I know we haven't taken any questions from the audience, but happy to take one. We only have like two minutes, so. One lucky guy. There's any, <laughs> anyone out there with a burning question, please feel free to ask. Do you see any hands? These no. lights are blinding me. I can't see a thing, actually. It's kind of bad to ask for anyone to raise their hand. And anyone got a question? All right, well, we're gonna give you uh, your less than two minutes back. So thank you very much, and thank you to the uh, panelists. Thank you. Thank you.